It's always been there, this giant white pedestal on the bottom of Earth. It's never exactly felt like a place that's easy to get to. After all, there are only research bases, snow, and ice. It might as well be another planet. Except it's not another planet, and it's home to some of the most amazing sights on Earth. And that means we gotta get there. So let's go on a journey to that seventh continent on the bottom of the world. And uh, spoiler alert, there's gonna be a lot of penguins. A lot of documentaries talk about Antarctica, and I will too, but I also want to talk about the experience of getting there. Hey, we are in Ushuaia right now. We are exactly one day away from embarking to Antarctica, but first we get to go to the southernmost part of the entire world right here on the tip of Argentina. And just a great little appetizer before jumping on that long boat all the way to Antarctica. So why leave from Ushuaia and not say leave from South Africa or Australia? It's more than just a question of distance. It's how Antarctica as we know it is comprised. Pretty much all around Antarctica is surrounded by a giant ice shelf. In fact, most of how we picture Antarctica is based on its ice shelf. Without it, it's actually a group of several masses that would look a whole lot different without ice. Luckily for us, and the planet, ice is still there. So to actually be able to see the continent by boat, the best way to go is from South America to the Antarctica Peninsula. Okay, back to Ushuaia, where we're about to depart. There was a ton of anticipation to get onto the boat. We could see it from kind of like the boardwalk area. We saw our ship in the distance at, on, the, on the pier. We know that in, in a few hours, we're gonna be on this boat going to a continent that few people ever really get a chance to go to. It was anxiety mixed with excitement because we had planned for so long and it was right there and it was so close. We left Ushuaia on the way down here um, and it was nice and calm because we're still in the Beagle Channel. All right, so we just began our first day of our trip to Antarctica. You can see behind us, we're, we just took off from Ushuaia, and we have two and a half days ahead of us before we get to any other real land, so a lot of potential seasickness, a lot of God knows what else we're gonna do for the next couple days. The road to Antarctica begins with passage through the Beagle Channel. a strait that goes through the Tierra del Fuego archipelago between Ushuaia and Argentina to the tip of the continent in Chile. We are right now in the Beagle Passage, about three hours past um, our, our, the point that we departed from in Ushuaia. Calm waters of the Beagle Channel allow us time to take in a last sunset before going south towards the midnight sun. Um, in about two hours from the beginning of the Great Passage, which apparently is supposed to be the toughest water on the planet. We're told the water is going to be really rough, but we're excited to see what that looks like. And according to the people that are in charge of the boat, they expect it to be pretty dangerous this time, so it should be a lot of fun. The, the Drake Passage itself lived up to its billing. 
It wasn't the roughest in the world, but for us, it was the roughest we've ever been on. The first night, we woke up at like one in the morning because all of the drawers on our nightstand just slammed open and like woke us up out of deep sleep because the Drake is some of the roughest waters in the world. Um, and it's kind of like the, the first barrier to get to the continent. And that's kind of what makes it so special. So why is the Drake Passage such an unpredictable and rough sea? Let's zoom out. Notice how the area of water is situated right between three unique bodies of water, the Pacific, the Atlantic, and the Southern Seas, with no land masses to slow the currents down, which creates the perfect recipe for a bumpy ride. The wakes can get as high as 10 meters. We're experiencing ones that are six, and I'm almost falling on my ass right now. It is incredibly cold and rough, and it takes over two days to get there over this passage. You can't walk in a straight line with these things, and they're relentless. Day and night, you're gonna have wakes, and it doesn't calm down. It's incredibly unpredictable and amazing. We've got swells that vary between about six feet and about 25 feet, which is creating a lot of movement inside the boat. Today, we're just enjoying the, the journey on the way to Antarctica. We have a day and a half left to travel to get there, and we are watching these seabirds fly in the back of the boat, and they are in the middle of nowhere. Right now, currently, we're at least four or 500 miles away from Antarctica. But interestingly, there's like a flock of birds that has followed the ship the whole time. It's like we have our own little ecosystem for them. And these, these albatross birds have been just kind of following this boat as we're going along, and these are huge birds, and there's not land for you know, hundreds of miles in any direction, but there are still these, these ocean-dwelling birds that just follow us along. As we reach the end of the Drake, anticipation of spotting land grows high. We're about five or six hours from hitting the Antarctica Peninsula. The last 12 hours at sea have been very rough. In fact, all the outside decks are actually closed. But what's really exciting, what we just noticed, is we see our first indication that we are, we are getting closer because there are icebergs um, up, up ahead on the right-hand side. All right, so it's just been about uh, a little under 48 hours, probably about 40 hours at sea right now, uh, crossing the Drake Passage. A little rough at times, uh, some pretty rough, rough seas, but we just got here, greeted by a whole bunch of zebras and flying around the boat ever since we've been really on the peak of Antarctica. I'm calling, I'm using my education for good purposes, where I learned how to speak whale. Okay, we're all gonna speak whale. Ready? Three, two, one. <laughs> Come on. Whoa. Whoa. Yours. <laughs> We've already seen three Gen 2 penguins, so the trip is already worth it, even if we saw nothing else, but we will. And check out this island behind us. We're getting ready to land, which is pretty exciting after being on a boat for two and a half days. Um, we're just right now, we're at the, the very tip of the peninsula of the South Shetland Islands. Um, about to disembark on our first adventure onto Greenwich Island, which is uh, one of the first islands that make up the South Shetland Islands. This is exciting. Uh, this is awesome, so hopefully uh, we'll, we'll get to see more soon. Our first stop in Antarctica is Barrientos Island. The first time we got off the boat and got onto the Zodiacs, we went to this island of penguins. Part of the South Shetland Islands at the very tip of the Antarctic Peninsula, Barrientos Island is home to both Chinstrap and Gentoo penguin colonies. This northern peninsula island is one of the few green islands with the land covered in moss and more notably, penguins. So we're in the South Shetland Islands. We just got off into a penguin colony with Gen 2 penguins and chinstrap penguins, which are a little bit more rare. Uh, two colonies on this island right now, and they are in the middle of breeding season. 
Before we get too much further, let's talk about the types of penguins we'll see. Generally, around the Antarctica Peninsula, you'll run into three types of penguins, the Gentoo, Chinstrap, and Adelie. They are really easy to tell apart. Gentoos have orange beaks and orange feet. Adelies have beady eyes and are all black and white. And Chinstraps have, well, they have Chinstraps. Okay, back to Barriento Island and more penguin talk. There are penguins everywhere, thousands of penguins. Let me underline that point. On this small island, there's literally 6,000 breeding pairs of penguins here. Which made my heart super happy because that's what I was most excited about when we came to Antarctica was seeing the penguins. They are the most adorable little animals that you could ever imagine. They walk around. They're really, really, okay, they're really graceful in the water and they're like killing machines in the water, but then they get onto land and they're like cartoon characters because they walk around like with their, their fins out to the back and um, they fall and they like slide on their stomach accidentally and like clamber back up and they're just adorable. So penguins smell terrible, and nothing can really prepare you for the smell of the penguins. It smells so bad. Everything is like a pink color because they eat krill, and that is like the color of the poo. <laughs> Although the birds are unafraid of humans because they have no natural land enemies, they do have an enemy from the sky. The birds that steal the eggs are called skewers. There's probably other ones as well, but that seems to be the biggest predator for young penguins and uh, penguin eggs. And they're big, big brown birds. They're very pretty as well, but what they do is they try to swoop in and steal the penguin eggs. Anytime they move is a chance for a bird to come and swipe and take their egg. We're trying very hard not to disturb them so that, that you know they don't do that. You can see them at all times near the nest, waiting for that opportunity to steal that penguin egg. Here you can see a gentoo on the outer skirts of its colony guarding its egg. The Arctic skua knows it has the upper hand and sees an easy meal until another Gen 2 comes to the rescue. At least for today, his egg will be safe. As the snow starts to fall on Barrientos Island, we head back to the Zodiacs and leave these penguins behind. But don't worry, I have more penguin stuff later. These might look like big seals, but these are just juveniles. They are nothing compared to a full-grown southern elephant seal. An adult bull seal can weigh as much as two sedans and a few motorcycles. They're big. And all that extra weight should keep them warm in this Antarctic snow. As the midnight sun shines bright, our vessel heads south to the snow-capped beauty of the Melchior Islands. Located between Anvers Islands and Brabant Islands, Melchior Islands are a group of small islands in the Palmer Archipelago, and home to the first base we'll see, 
the Argentinian Melchior base. This base was founded in 1947 and became one of the main weather forecasting stations on the continent, but this is far from the only base in Antarctica. Currently, there are 70 bases representing 29 countries with upwards of 4,000 people scattered throughout the continent. The history of many bases vary, from expeditions to land claims to scientific research. However, since the signing of the Antarctic Treaty in 1959 by 54 nations, the stations are now used for scientific study of various kinds. It's because of this treaty that we are able to go hike this entirely untouched island and see it for the same beauty that its original Argentinian explorers saw nearly 80 years ago. Let's go. This is one of the main activities that we signed up for, was doing this hike. We really wanted to go hike, touch land in Antarctica, and actually, you know, go up a mountain. All right, it's early morning in Antarctica. We just got to the Melchior Islands, um, and we're about to go hiking about 150 meters up in this nice day. Um, got our axe, got our sticks, we're ready to go. Let's do it. They, we got off the Zodiac, saw a couple of penguins just hanging out. A couple of chin strap and a couple of Gen 2 penguins just greet us. And because there's only a group of like 10 of us, they, they weren't too flustered about anything. The climb itself is short, but because we are hiking on old ice and snow, we still use an abundance of caution. We use specialized snowshoes to distribute our weight and tie ourselves to each other so that no one can get stuck in a hidden crevasse. And you know, like die or get hurt. Ouch. Hiked up, it was essentially kind of two big mounds. Um, it was a simple hike, it wasn't very strenuous, but it was a perfect day, perfect blue sky. The water was pretty calm. I don't know how they did it, but even at 100 meters high and half a mile from land, a chin strap penguin couple is checking out the views from above. Due to the region's dry air and lack of trees, the views when hiking up are always spectacular. And so once we got up to kind of the second dome of elevation, uh, we had a pretty spectacular view of of the entire harbor. As we look left and we look right, we see icebergs everywhere. We see these mountains as far as the eye can see. The sky is super blue. You can see for miles and miles. It was hard to get a better view than that. The 360 view of, of where we're at, that's the first this is the first time we can really see where we're at because we've been on a boat for two and a half days. You really get that sense there at that moment, like, we, wow, <laughs> we're in Antarctica. <laughs> we are here. And as we get into our zodiacs and head south, leaving the Melchior Islands behind, we look forward to finally stepping foot on continental Antarctica in Orne Harbor. But on our way down, a pod of type A orcas breached the ocean's surface right next to our ship and put on quite a show for its passengers. The start of the Antarctic summer means that the orcas will be frequenting these seas for several months looking for food. So there's laws in, our, in Antarctica about how many people can be on the continent at once. Remember that Antarctica Treaty? Well, part of that treaty signed by these guys was to limit the tourism impact on the continent. So now it allows only 100 people on shore at once at any given time, and will prevent big ships like these from ever setting sail to Antarctica. So as groups of tourists, scientists, and guides check out Orne Harbor, we will cruise around the increasingly icy waters looking for wildlife. So we get on the Zodiac again, and uh, we're cruising around, and we are lucky enough to come across a leopard seal. 
they're, they're kind of hard to find because they like to float around on icebergs and they are predators unlike other seals like other seals will kind of they eat mostly krill and, they, and they'll prey on penguins a little bit but leopard seals are almost carnivores and they specifically go after other animals seals penguins etc they've got big canine teeth this seal, when we came up on him, he opened his mouth, so we got to see all the sharp, jagged teeth inside um, as he's just re relaxing on an iceberg, and it was it was amazing to see. It is amazing to see a seal, a leopard seal, that close, and that was one of the things I hope I hoped that we would see when we got here. And we were cruising around and we saw it. That wouldn't be the only seal we'd see. Floating along the ice, we'd also spot a crab eater seal, which despite their names, eat krill, not crab. Yeah, it's a poorly chosen name. So we are on a zodiac on an excursion to land. And before we do that, we take a long kind of zodiac tour through the water and we were looking at some seals and penguins and then all of a sudden out, come, out of the water comes this massive humpback whale and shows us his fin, her fins as she dives straight back down, which, oh, yeah. uh, like you never, there's no way to prepare for that. That's so cool. Okay, to the right of our zodiac, we've just come across a big humpback whale and we were lucky enough to see it breach and the tail's gonna, the tail's gonna come, oh my gosh! Wow! Oh my god, that was amazing. We just saw a humpback whale dive down into the into the ocean and it was for probably 50 feet away from it, maybe maybe 75 feet, and it is it was incredible. I've never been that close to a whale before. When our zodiac finally hits Orn Harbor we hike to the top of our first continental landfall. We're standing on top of a mountain and it's so beautiful that it almost doesn't feel real. It creates such emotions of happiness and excitement because just when you think things can't get any prettier, they do. And we've seen so many things today and now this is the most beautiful overlook I've ever ever seen in my entire life and words just can't describe how wonderful this place is. When you're surrounded by so much beauty, words are hard to come by, maybe the best thing to do is stay longer. Or better yet, just camp there all night. I have here my luxury accommodations in Antarctica. Baby sack. Uh, and that's all. <laughs> like stopping down a pathway to put out a mat, then put down our baby in the sleeping bag so we can sleep in the snow because we decided to spend a night outside camping in the Antarctic. So this is what it looks like, which is pretty awesome. It doesn't get dark in Antarctica in the summertime and it is peak summertime right now. So it's, we're, we're laying there, it's bright out. Um, the, the sleeping bags have little cocoons so you can actually pull the thing over your head and then tie it closed so that it protects you from the elements here. Uh, I'm going to get into my sleeping bag on the frozen ground. I'm skipping down into some layers that are comfortable to sleep in. Beautiful outside though. Totally worth it. Totally worth it. So no conversations, no direction, no anything else. We just kind of found a little hole to dig and then lay down and slept for four or five hours. All right, so we are here camping on Antarctica. It's our first night, our only night of camping, and we have a guest, or maybe we are the guest. But there is a big crab eater seal over next to our campground, and he looks very comfy and cozy, and I hope that he comes over to my, to my my place for a snuggle.
Well, it's rise and shine, and off even further down the peninsula, to Neko and Paradise Harbor. It's Neko Harbor where we will go first. And after a restless night, we board the Zodiac and make landfall. Where Gen 2 penguins are hanging out with a really out of place female elephant seal. I'll be honest, the idea of going on a huge hike the day after we slept like four hours while camping, combined with the fact that I was feeling pretty crappy, was not the most appealing option in the world. But as we climbed in Neko Harbor and saw the glimpse of the giant glacier that we'd be so closely approaching, it quickly became worth it. This glacier here is nearly 200 feet tall and stretches back as far as you can see, and is just one of thousands of glaciers that surround the Antarctic Peninsula and create the icebergs that we see in the channels. The further south we go, the bigger they get. From on top of the mountain to in the water. Our next stop will get us up close and personal with Base Brown in Paradise Harbor, where we will explore in a kayak. Whereas every Antarctic base is steeped with history, Base Brown's is a little more dark. In 1984, after a doctor was told he had to stay another year in the base and avoid seeing his love, he became furious. And instead of staying another year, he did the most logical thing. He burned the whole base down. The base has since been rebuilt, but now only operates in the summer months for biological studies. Kayaking is kind of a really intimate way to experience Antarctica because when you're on the Zodiac, you're there with, you know, 11 other people on, on the Zodiac and you have a driver who's like deciding where you go. But with kayaking, your fate is kind of in your own hands. You, you kind of have to stick with the group, but you, there's a lot more leeway if you want to see something a little closer. And with Antarctic seabirds all around the cliffs of Paradise Harbor, it's the perfect time to get a closer look. The rocky cliffs at the water's edge create the perfect shelter for a variety of seabirds. Like the Cape Petrel. In the Imperial Blue-Eyed Shag. which build their nest out of seaweed and mud and can last several years. It's pretty good craftsmanship. And just below the cliffs on the rocky shores below, you'll see the Antarctic Terns. And on the icebergs around the island, where there's birds, there's skuas. It's a bunch of penguins, and I've been trying to get them on the GoPro all morning, and finally I just got a bunch of them, so hopefully the video turns out great. Our next stop would take us to see a lot more penguins as we go to the southernmost post office on Earth, Port Lockroy, AKA the Penguin Post Office. This British base is known as much for its penguins that surround it as it is for its claim to the southernmost post office in the world. And, well, we got a mail letter, right? I'm writing a postcard to Aunt Kyle where we will mail it from the Penguin Post Office in Port Lockroy in Antarctica. So it may take 
three weeks to three months to get there, but she'll get it eventually. By that time, she should have an adequate amount of time to at least knit at least 10 penguin sweaters for the little penguin chicks. Port Lockroy wasn't always just a post office. Port Lockroy Station A, as it's known, was established during World War II as a research base by the British. It housed between four to nine men who stayed on average two winters. Today, it is a museum, full of old research equipment and paraphernalia from the time. And, you know, how you might imagine a hut with four to nine dudes stuck in the winter for years might look after a few years of wear and tear. And you know that nickname, Penguin Post Office? Well, it's a well-deserved title. There are tens of thousands of penguins here spread out all over the island, and right now it's nesting season, so you can see them making nests for each other. Remember, there aren't any twigs or grass to make a nest this far south. So if you want to make a nest, you gotta get creative. Penguins use rocks to keep its eggs protected from the elements. The bigger the nest, the better. And let's be honest, some penguins are better at this than others. They all nest in colonies. And we learned that while penguins are social animals, like they, they live in colonies, they're not very like friendly to each other. They will often go around and like steal little pebbles out of other penguins' nests to bring to their mate. The effort that goes into stealing varies a lot. This Gen 2 barely walks a foot. Pretty brazen. And this guy, whose mate is perched right under the British flag post, he's giving the Ocean's Eleven crew a run for their money. We tracked this penguin for almost 15 minutes trying to see where he'd go, and he didn't disappoint. Behind the flagpole and down the penguin highway it goes. And up we go. Not the easiest thing to do without arms. And pay dirt. A big muddy rock straight from the base. Sorry, uh, he'll be taking that now. And back the little Gen 2 goes to right under the British flag. And no one knows the wiser. Well done. Well, when you were in Antarctica, there inevitably comes a time when you just can't get any further south. And we hit that point with the ice-filled La Mer Channel. But not before exploring its iceberg-filled waterway. One of, the, one of my favorite things is seeing these glaciers. And when we're going out into the Zodiac, one of our last Zodiac tours, where we're, we're jumping in the Zodiac and we're going straight towards uh, this channel that's full of ice. And as we're going through the ice, we're churning through a whole bunch of ice. We're seeing giant mountains on the left and on the right. These icebergs all around us that are just enormous. 30, 40, 50 feet sticking out in the air, at least the ones we got close to, which means that 90% are still underneath, so they're absolutely gigantic. Some of these icebergs have these incredible icicles just dropping off the sides that are just, you know, just, just blue in a, in a way that looks at almost like Caribbean. It's, the, the color of the icebergs is amazing. It's like this deep, beautiful blue. It looks like it, it, it's clear in a way that's just unbelievable. And then there's some that just have the these sculptures that almost look like a cathedral that's being built into the size of these icebergs. Even though they're mostly submerged, the stuff that is actually shown is just, um, 
beautiful in a way that only nature can create. It is spectacular. Sometimes hard to, to judge how big any of the icebergs were because from afar they looked tiny, up close they looked huge, but when you saw another Zodiac drive in front and you can see perspective, they were absolutely gigantic. Um, we drove close to one and the, the, the guy driving our Zodiac already mentioned um, that, that he thought it was a relatively big iceberg, but it was still way, way, way too small to be um, even named, um, given the size of some of the other icebergs that are out there that are 15, 20 miles wide. So yeah, that iceberg's big, but to be like officially named big, you have to be at least 12 square miles. That's equivalent to 5,731 football fields, and that's the minimum. But it doesn't have to be a giant named Glacier to make for a good bed for this Weddell seal. You see four Gentoo penguins on top of a giant iceberg in the middle of the ocean, and it's amazing. I promised there would be a lot of penguins. They really do add to the magic of this wonderful place. I think you could say I followed through on that promise. After seeing all this beautiful wildlife and scenery, the only thing left to do is jump in the water yourself. So we are approaching an area in between an absolutely massive iceberg and the boat, which should create a calm, which allows us to do the polar plunge. And remember, because it's salt water, it can actually be below freezing. So this is gonna be really cold. It was in the La Mer Channel, and 100 people on the boat did it. Which was most of the ship. Some decided to do other things. I mean, people got really excited before we had to get on our swimsuits and get in our bathrooms and line up. We're ready to do this. Dude. And so someone had music playing and everyone was getting super excited and trying to psych themselves up to, to jump off the boat. A bunch of people went before us and we were cheering as they came back. Pretty awesome. Kind of went around the corner and jumped off the same platform that we uh, would get onto the Zodiacs to do any of the Zodiac cruising before. They put a harness on you, right? So everyone has a harness before you're allowed to jump in and they do that because I think Every once in a while someone panics or seizes or goes into shock or whatever and like can't get themselves out and have to be like drug out by a leash and so I was wondering if I was going to be that guy. Let's do this! Leading up to it there was a ton of anticipation because everyone was jumping in and then frantically getting out and barely able to talk because they were so cold and then so I went before anyone else in our little group and the guy basically said look over, smile, say hi and then jump whenever you're ready and so I waved at the camera woman and then jumped off. And was out of the water in about three seconds flat. the narrator, it is a lot better to talk fondly of this being in the future, I'll admit. But after weeks in the continent, jumping all in just feels like the best way to embrace it completely. I think what's amazing about Antarctica is that it's, it's a very, it's so remote and it's so untouched. We're all so thrilled about adventure and going places that are special and going off the beaten path and seeing the things that aren't designed for tourists. So you don't see trees that are, are bulldozed to build a building. You don't see foundations of concrete. You don't see people anywhere. The only signs of, of humanity are the tiniest little bases or the few footprints that we put in while we're climbing. And to that, that much space just unexplored and just so newly explored makes you really feel like you're on the cutting edge of exploration. And I think there's something that's just very 
uh, human about wanting to see something so something so undisturbed and so natural that makes you realize both how big the planet is and how small the planet is at the same time. There's just something special about it, something so wild about it, and so relaxing about it that it's, it's one of the few places that I've been in my life that I will have to return to one day because it's that amazing. No longer is Antarctica just a white pedestal in the bottom of Earth. But after time there, it's an experience. A memory. It's a living, breathing place, both epic and fragile. Antarctica isn't the end of the world. It's the start of Earth's last great adventure. Thanks for watching. I made this video as a total passion project that took months and appreciate you checking it out. If you like it, give it a thumbs up, leave a comment and subscribe for more videos in the future.